So uh, two weeks ago, Van Pavlik, who's one of the badasses of the Aphrodite Academy, he posted this article on our Facebook group, our members only page, and the post was about marijuana and how it relates to testosterone levels, how it relates to sperm and reproduction. And it's interesting because, I mean, this is such a big topic. I mean, the, as you're watching this right now, you might be someone who smokes marijuana, or you may have thought about smoking it, or you may have friends who smoke it, or maybe in 10 years when marijuana becomes, you know, just all over the world and, 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 and and the use becomes very frequent in different countries because they start making it legal, maybe you'll start smoking marijuana too. So I want to make this video, today's video, it's going to be a very, very thorough video. I'm going to cover everything that we know scientifically about the relationship between marijuana and masculinity. And it's not just going to be testosterone. It's going to be energy metabolism, sperm, different types of neurological disorders and how weed is being used to treat those. Also things like appetite and sleep and anxiety. What do we know about marijuana and how does it work in the brain? How does it work in the body? I'm going to explain to you the mechanisms just like I did in the previous video about habits. Um, how, does, how does the synapse work in the brain? And I'm going to explain that to you today as well with this topic. So anyway, Van published this, uh, or Van posted this uh, article, and the article is a recent one. It's 2019. It was just published a couple of months ago, and it was controversial because they showed that smoking weed can enhance masculinity, and more specifically, that it can improve sperm function, it can improve reproductive function, and it can increase testosterone in men. And the reason that was controversial is because a lot of studies in the past have shown the opposite, that weed decreases testosterone. It really messes up the parameters that regard sperm as being vital and being, being viable and strong. So it was kind of controversial. So then, you know, about two and a half years ago, I made this weed documentary in Miami. You know, I was in Miami. We interviewed all these people in the street during, it was on April 20th. So I suppose it was uh, almost three years ago in Miami. And, uh, and, and so, you know, I, I had these 20 chapters in this, in this documentary and a couple of those chapters had to do with the science of testosterone and marijuana and cannabis. And since that time, from 2015, 16 to 2019, there have been a lot more studies published. And now we know a little bit more, not a lot more, but a little bit more, more controversy, more mechanisms have now been found um, about how all this works. So we're going to get into all of that, that in this video. Now, if we, so, so let me, let me walk you. And, and by the way, before I start this, let me uh, do day 13 of our dirty 30 challenge. So right now, if you're a member of the Academy, you already know this. But if you're not a member of the Academy, let me explain to you what's happening. So this month we have the Dirty 30 Challenge, hashtag Dirty 30. And the way it works is over these 30 days, every single person in the Academy has this challenge, this cha challenge number eight. You know how in this testosterone transformation group, you have those 10 challenges that you do as part of your 10 day transformation. In the Academy, we also have challenges, but they are more... Uh, they're not just to be done in one day. They take more time and they take more work and it's more powerful, more, it's, it's a higher, higher level of challenge. Anyway, so this challenge number eight, you know, these first seven have already been done by the Academy members. Now it's number eight. It's for 30 days, no weed, no alcohol, no drugs, um, and no porn and Afro D every day. And what we do is we raw dog and we take a picture or we take a video. So I'm taking this video and then we post it on the Facebook group. So I'm sure you've seen this in the one on ones. You've seen me probably do this before. You, you saw me do it in the previous um, uh, video. So yeah, let me let me raw dog real quick. I'm almost done with this package. I'm going to have to get a new one from tomorrow. 
So yeah, raw dog is you just take a teaspoon like this and you... Hmm? Take the whole thing. Yeah, this is Afro D. And obviously, for those of you who want to know about, more about Afro D, there's going to be a link in the comments below. If you have a question for the next video that I make, post that in the comments below. And we've also sent you a form, which is a questionnaire about what questions you want to ask that you want me to address in future videos so you can put it in there, that Google form as well or very easily in the comments below. Let me get some water here. Um, okay, so let's begin first by, let me, let me tell you about my story about weed. Do I smoke marijuana? When have I smoked marijuana? What is my story? So, I didn't start smoking marijuana regularly until I was in Vegas Immersion. In, in Las Vegas with RSD. So we had a group of guys, we were about five, six of us, we would go to a friend's house and we would smoke there. And it wasn't every day, it was something like once a week, once every two weeks. But when we smoked, we smoked quite a bit and we got high before we went to the club. And you know, look, I've tried pretty much everything. I've tried uh, you know, cocaine, I've tried LSD multiple times. I've tried ayahuasca, magic mushrooms, molly, you know, ecstasy, and of course weed. And every trip that I've ever had has been wonderful. I'm a, I, I do very good when I go on a trip. And it's so cool because I write notes down, you know, very academically I experience these trips. You know, I, I do it in a science way. So I write down what I feel during the trip, and then after the trip I look at my notes to see what I experienced and how I transformed through this drug because I want to be able to get to those levels in real life without the aid of the drug. And I haven't smoked marijuana in about probably two, two and a half years. It's been a while since I smoked marijuana. And there's no real reason to smoke it because my environment is not conducive to smoking it. None of my friends smoke it. None of the people that I live with smoke it. None of my colleagues smoke it. So. It's not a big deal for me, but for you, you might be someone who smokes every day. You might be someone who is in an environment of smoking marijuana. I mean, you look at, you know, Uruguay, it's legal there. Amsterdam, you know, the Netherlands, it's legal there. A lot of places, it's becoming recreationally legal. You know, half of the American states have legalized marijuana. Canada just legalized marijuana, as I just talked about. So as we move forward, marijuana will be legalized more and more in the rest of the world. I mean, it's big money. The stocks are doing well. One of our uh, Academy members, Tom, who's a Wall Street uh, options trader here in New York, you know, one of his colleagues made a million dollars in one day on a pot stock. You know, he invested in a Canadian pot stock and he made a million dollars in one day doing this trading. So it's a big deal, right? Marijuana. So this is a good topic for us to cover. Now, for me, whenever I've done marijuana, there's a certain phase that I go through to know that I'm on this trip. The first thing that happens is I lose orientation of my spatial memory. And we're going to get into spatial memory here very soon. I, I talk about it here, spatial memory here. And basically what happens is the world around me, the, the physical spatial distribution of, of the environment becomes a little disoriented. It's a little disbalanced for me. That's the first stage of my trip in marijuana. The second stage is I lose all track of memory, like general memory. I don't remember what happened today or the, yesterday or the day before. I can't bring myself into the past or the future. I'm very much in the present moment. And the third is eye contact and very strict focus on the person I'm looking at. So I remember in Vegas, there were times where I would be on, on, a, on a weed trip. And you know, we would have, a, there was, I remember this one particular time, I picked up these two girls, one blonde, one brunette, they were friends. 
Uh, they, were, they had come from Victoria, BC, really, really hot girls. I picked them up from the Vegas mall, and then that night we met them up at our house. And my, one of my wingmen, and, and also a, a you know, very good friend of mine at the time, he took the blonde, he was with her in the room, and I was sitting with her brunette friend outside in the balcony. And I still remember very particularly that I was making some soul-piercing eye contact with her. I was tripping at that time. She was completely sober. And I was looking at her in the eye. And I literally stared at her eyes for like three minutes. Like just completely forgotten everything that's happening in the world and just stared at her in her eyes. And I could consciously experience the fact that she wasn't getting freaked out. That's what was weird, right? I was getting freaked out. I'm like, I'm looking at this girl so deeply and I'm not even taking my eyes off. It's so natural, but I'm so scared, but she's not getting freaked out. She's so calm about this. And that was one of these deep experiences I had with eye contact and focus and being so in the moment. So weed has been very good to me, let's just say. I remember not that night, but another night, we went out to the club to excess one of the nightclubs in Vegas. And there was this one girl right outside the bathroom. Again, I was on a weed trip. And I was staring at her very deeply, like right in her eyes, right outside the bathroom. And she had mentioned that she has a husband. And you know, in Vegas, when these girls come, even if they're, they're married and stuff, they cheat on their husbands. And, and you know, it's, it's like very easy to, to pick up girls like that because you know, they're under the influence of alcohol. You can bring them home, you can fuck them. And you know, in the morning, they'll show you the pictures of their kids and their husband. It's unbelievable what happens in Vegas. So I remember this one girl, she looked at me and I was staring so deeply into her eyes that she literally became scared and ran into the bathroom like I was gonna fuck her right there and then. It was unbelievable stuff. Anyway, so the reason, let me make sure this camera is recording because uh, it's been acting up on me. Yeah, it's already been 12 minutes. This is gonna become long, just like always. I wanna cover everything for you and really explain to you what's happening with, with weed and, and my life and then get into all the science. So that's sort of my um, story when it comes to my experience, okay? Now, once I cover all this material, if you still have questions, I'm gonna make a part two for you, so don't worry. You can put all your questions in the comments below if I miss something, all right? So what am I gonna cover? So how does marijuana affect arousal, libido, testosterone, right? This is the testosterone topic because we all know the main thing testosterone affects is libido, arousal, sexual appetite, okay? So testosterone levels. Then we get into sperm reproduction because that is also a big part of masculinity. Remember, this is about how testosterone affects masculinity, okay? And then the third one is gonna be et cetera. It's gonna be what? Sleep, cognitive functions, memory learning, spatial memory, metabolism, right? And we're gonna get into how does it affect cancer, uh, anxiety, depression, uh, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, what happens in the brain? Where are all these, these weed receptors located in the body. How does it actually work, okay? So that's the first thing I'm gonna get into. That's what this is, introduce, okay? Then I'm gonna get into the ECS. ECS is the system that the components of marijuana, the, the, the individual parts of the, the drug, what they target in the brain, the receptors they target, what they do, that whole thing is known as the ECS, the endocannabinoid system. It's a very, very complex and interesting system, especially in neuroscience, and I'm gonna get into all of that. Then we get into the mechanisms, and I'm gonna explain to you exactly what happens at the synaptic level, because look, one of the reasons we have the testosterone transformation group, one of the reasons we have the Afro-D Academy, right? One of the reasons we have these, these communities here for you guys is because when you get, go out into the world, I want you to have the confidence to talk about health topics. When someone is arguing with you about weed or testosterone or diet or veganism or, 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 or compound movements or, or intermittent fasting or whatever the topic is, habit formation, porn addiction, whenever someone's talking with you about these topics, I want you to have confidence to discuss with them and debate with them. 
I don't want you to take a back seat. I want you to argue and, and disagree when the time comes because you will have the knowledge and expertise just like I have. I'm imparting all of that, that to you because when you go out into the world and you read these scientific papers or you argue with someone who is a guru, you can tell them specifically why you believe what you believe and how it actually works in the brain and I bet you they won't know. So this gives you this superpower, this very, very specific way to know the mechanisms that are happening and how it actually works so you can appreciate it and you can actually believe what I'm saying, okay? So we're gonna get into the mechanism. Then, then this, so MJ is marijuana, that's MJ. Cannabis, marijuana, weed, marijuana. I'm gonna get into the, the, the differences soon. What does all these words mean? But I've just written different words here for your understanding. We're gonna say, is it positive or negative for testosterone? Is it positive or negative for sperm? Is it po positive or negative for the brain and cognitive function? Then we're gonna summarize and conclude, and then I'm gonna get into a little bit of how you can get your hands on Afro D, what the one-on-one -on -one sessions are, and question and answers, and all this stuff, okay? So let's get started. The first thing I wanna talk about is, what is weed? What is marijuana? So, the plant that marijuana comes from is known as cannabis, right? Cannabis sativa is the scientific name for the plant. And you can take the leaves and the flowers of this plant, you can extract those out, and you can make many types of strains and, 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 and varieties of different things you smoke. So marijuana is one of those components, and then marijuana can split into many, many, many different strains of marijuana, or hashish. Hashish is also one of the derivatives of the cannabis sativa plant. Now, marijuana or weed, whatever you want to call it, there are certain very prominent components inside those. Some are psychoactive, right? They're, they're, they, they activate certain parts of your brain. So, you know, they target anxiety, they target depression, they target stimulation. And then there are those that are non-psychoactive, right? So there's different types of components inside cannabis. The one we're gonna talk about most in today's video is THC, okay? Tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, THC. Uh, let me make sure uh, one second. Because I know I was looking up these things. I know there's uh, cannabinol and cannabidiol. And I just want to 100% uh, give you the right, uh, yeah, cannabinol, as I said. So tetrahydrocannabinol is what THC stands for. It's delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. And THC is the one component. You, you know, you'll see guys, they, they take pure THC sometimes, pure THC. Then you'll see guys who take a certain percentage of THC in what they smoke. Now p things are becoming very technologically advanced. So you can tell your dealer to give you this percentage of THC. There's apps out there that give you a specific percentage of THC for your medical reasons or recreational reasons. So THC is the main one we're gonna talk about. Now, let's talk about the ECS next, the endocannabinoid system. The, endocan the endocannabinoid system exists in our entire body. It is a very complex system. It has existed for, you know, throughout evolution. It is known as the master system of evolution. Why? Because it serves a very general purpose of homeostasis. Now, what do I mean by that? Imagine a synapse, like this synapse. And I'm going to get into the detail of this soon, but imagine a synapse which is producing too much of a certain neurotransmitter, like glutamate, or GABA, or any neurotransmitter, pick one. What happens is, there has to be a mechanism to regulate if too much of that neurotransmitter is being released. So to make that homeostasis happen, to make that balance happen, the endocannabinoid system produces endocannabinoids, Okay, these are just molecules, lipid molecules, 
that penetrate out of the postsynaptic. Remember, postsynaptic, I talked about it in the previous video. The synapse that gives the neurotransmitter away, it, it, the neurotransmitter comes out of it. That's known as the presynaptic neuron or the presynaptic terminal, pre meaning before. And the postsynaptic neuron is the after, post is after. It's the one that receives the neurotransmitter. So, so endocannabinoids, these, these molecules, which are these cubes that I've drawn, they produce, they are produced by the postsynaptic neuron when there's too much of a neurotransmitter. And these endocannabinoids go into the presynaptic terminal and turn off or inactivate or block the production of the neurotransmitter that was being produced too much. So imagine glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It excites neurons. It's what happens when we learn something. It's the excitatory neurotransmitter. When there's too much of glutamate, the endocannabinoid system will shut that system off so glutamate is blocked. There's no more glutamate coming out of that presynaptic neuron. That's what the endocannabinoid system does. It's a very, very robust system. It's all over the body, right? It's, you have endocannabinoid receptors, right? It's, or you can just call them cannabinoid receptors, CB, and then R for a receptor. So the main receptor that we're going to talk about is the CB1 receptor. Okay, this is the receptor that THC binds to, right? So if you smoke cannabis, the THC inside that, it's not an endocannabinoid, right? These, these cubes that I've drawn, these are endocannabinoids. These are the molecules that are already in your body. They're natural. THC is an exogenous cannabinoid. It comes from the outside into the body through cannabis or marijuana, okay? So that's what THC is. It is an exogenous cannabinoid. It binds to the same receptor as the endocannabinoids bind to. So that's how THC messes up or disrupts the natural system that is in your body. So you can imagine right now in your body, in your testes, there are cannabinoid receptors. In your brain, so in your hippocampus, in your amygdala, in your hypothalamus, uh, in your striatum, in your basal ganglia. I mean, all over your brain, where especially where there are the arousal centers, the erection centers of your brain, these cannabinoid receptors are there. So when you smoke cannabis, you smoke marijuana, the THC goes and binds to these receptors all over your body, right? And they're not just in your brain, they're in your kidney, they're in your liver, they're in your spleen, they're in your pancreas, they're in your testes, they're in your epididymis, they're in your vas deferens, these are all reproductive organs in your body. So when you smoke cannabis, the ingredient THC will go and bind all over the body. So the endocannabinoids that are in your body that are usually binding to these receptors are now competing with THC. So you can imagine what might happen. It's a very complex system. Okay, so that's the explanation of how the endocannabinoid system works. Again, it's the master system. It exists in other animals, you know, it exists in rats, it exists in monkeys, it exists in lizards, it exists in all... I'm not sure if it exists in all animals, but I know that it's very much something that has been passed on through evolution because it's such a strong system. It's for homeostasis. Now, what is the mechanism? Let's get into the mechanism next. So, um, so what I'm going to do is, just to make it easy, because I've written so much, I'm going to start erasing things so it becomes easy for you, so you, you kind of see what we've already covered, right? So we, we talked about how uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about these things in the whole video. So I can erase this right now, okay? Not a big deal. We already covered all this stuff, okay? And we've covered the introduction.
Voila. Okay. Now, let's talk about the mechanism next. So, this is the presynaptic neuron. It's the, part, it's the neuron that is giving the neurotransmitter to another neuron. Okay, it's, call it like neuron one, and this is neuron two. Okay, so these red dots represent the neurotransmitter. And imagine that this is dopamine or glutamate or GABA or any neurotransmitter, serotonin, pick one, acetylcholine. Now this, these neurotransmitters come down from this neuron and they're released and they bind to these receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. Now if, too, if this happens too much, there's too much of, of these neurotransmitters, then these endocannabinoids are made by the postsynaptic neuron. It's called biosynthesis. And once these are made, they come out and they bind right here. They bind to the cannabinoid receptor, CB1, as I was telling you, right? CB1. This is the main receptor that THC binds to, that these endocannabinoids bind to. But THC is not an endocannabinoid. It's not natural. It comes from outside. It comes from the smoking. And when it binds, when this cube, this cube right here, as it flows, and it binds right here to the cannabinoid receptor, it blocks the neurotransmitter from flowing to this neuron. So as the neurotransmitter is going in, it's so much that this system blocks and then these neurotransmitters don't go to neuron 2 anymore. They become recycled and they, they stay here in this neuron. So this is what I'm explaining here, okay? Now, what are these two guys? These are support cells of this main neuron system, right? This is a synapse. This is, this is what a synapse looks like. Now, these two are what are known as glial cells. These are support cells for the neuron, okay? This is an astrocyte. This is the thing that gives a neuron the myelin, uh, which is this, this little sheath outside the neuron that makes the transmission faster. So imagine you have a wire and you put this sheath across the wire to continue the signal across the network. That's what's happening in the brain. That's what the astrocyte does. Now the astrocyte also has this CB1 receptor. This microglia also has a receptor, but it's the CB2 receptor. So the reason I'm drawing you this is I'm trying to make you understand that this entire system is happening all over the brain. And remember, last video I talked about habit formation. I talked about dopamine and how dopamine, the dopamine reward system hijacks your brain. And this, this is what I'm written right here, dopamine. So the way weed makes you addicted to not only weed, but general addiction is this. Let's say you smoke marijuana today. The THC is gonna bind to these CB1 receptors. It's not this guy, it's coming from outside, right? The THC is something you're smoking. So it's coming from outside the body. So it's gonna accumulate just like that. It's gonna bind to these CB1 receptors and it's gonna increase dopamine release, not decrease, but increase, right? So sometimes the endocannabinoid system decreases a neurotransmitter. But in cases of addiction, just like I talked about last time in the last video, it increases the neurotransmitter release. So in, think of a rat. A rat is, is, is not addicted to something yet. He's, he's, let's say he's eating food or he's taking a pellet. If you disrupt the endocannabinoid system and give this rat THC, or you bump up the endocannabinoids inside this rat, the rat will like the food more. The, the food will become more palatable. It'll become, he'll have a greater affinity to the food and he will eat that food more and he will become addicted to that food. So the endocannabinoid system 
allows us to become addicted to weed. So when you're eating, when you when you're smoking that THC, the reason you're addicted to marijuana is because it has hijacked your dopamine system. It has hijacked the reward system of your brain, just like cocaine does, just like porn does, just like alcohol does. Weed does the same thing through the endocannabinoid system. So that's what I'm explaining here. Okay, nucleus accumbens. Remember, in the previous video, I discussed with you how there's this area of the brain in the basal ganglia, it's known as a nucleus accumbens. It's, it's around the hypothalamus in the basal forebrain. And it's how, it's the area which has that dopamine circuit that gets you addicted when you watch porn. The same nucleus accumbens is the area that gets targeted by THC. The same nucleus accumbens has the CB1 receptors. Okay, so this is also a big thing for THC, not just for porn. Okay, so that's what I've drawn here, and, and this is what this is. So let me, let me now erase this. And, and I know I've written a lot of stuff here, it's just I wanted to fit all the details so you understand what's going on. And like I said, I'll e explain these things even more if you want a part two, okay? Okay, so, so we just covered that. Now let's cover testosterone. What is happening in our body as men when we smoke weed? What is happening to arousal? What is happening to sexual appetite? What is happening to our sexual performance? Okay, so let's start with testosterone. Now, does marijuana increase or decrease testosterone? Now, what do we know so far? We know for a fact that there have been studies that show how THC decreases GnRH. Now, you may not remember this, but GnRH is the neurotransmitter in the hypothalamus that starts the process of testosterone production. So, I don't know if you remember this, but I covered it many times in many videos. GnRH in the hypothalamus is released. That binds to the GnRH receptor in the pituitary gland, which releases LH, luteinizing hormone, and that, that LH binds to the testes and the testes produce testosterone, right? So this is known as the HPT axis, right? So hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and testes, right? The HPT axis. So the HPT axis starts with the production of GnRH in the hypothalamus, and we know from studies that GnRH production gets negatively affected by THC, by the endocannabinoid system, by cannabinoid receptors, okay, CB1. So if GnRH goes down, that may lead to a decrease in testosterone. But that paper, the paper I'm talking about right now, just found a decrease in GnRH. Now, we also know that there is a decrease in LH, luteinizing hormone. So some papers show that luteinizing hormone decreases when you have cannabis or THC specifically bind to CB1 receptors, and this has been done in animals, okay? So most of the studies that I'm gonna talk about, you can assume they were done in animals but then when I talk about human studies, I'm going to mention it specifically. Oh, this was done in humans. But, but something to note is this when it comes to THC and, and these things. The, because the endocannabinoid system is so robust and it's so evolutionary stable, why it's called the master system, something that is discovered in rats or monkeys or mice don't disregard it as BS, because that does mean a lot, even for us as humans. It does mean a lot, because the mechanisms are the same, okay? So, obviously in a video like this, it's hard for me to tell you exactly which studies are human, which studies are animals, because I haven't memorized everything. 
but I'm going to try to do my best here for you, okay? So that's what we know with this. Okay, arousal. So arousal is a tricky one. A lot of the studies that I read, the effect on arousal depends on how much of marijuana you smoke. So a lot of papers, what they show is, regardless of your initial state, you smoke a little bit, you get aroused. But with chronic smoking, or you smoke too much, your arousal will go down. So it's this, it's not some linear thing where, oh, I'm going to keep smoking and I'm going to keep getting aroused. I'm going to keep smoking, I'm going to keep getting aroused. It's not like that. There's a level where you get the arousal, but then the arousal goes away if you do too much. So that's, this, that's what we know about arousal. And obviously, you know from your experience of smoking weed. Like when I smoked weed, I got aroused like a motherfucker, like really aroused. I was really horny and a lot of the times I even had premature ejaculation because I really wanted to like fuck this girl and just put it inside her and, and, and just ejaculate in her right away. Like I couldn't really control it. And I remember sometimes, especially in Florida, I would like, I remember one specific time, you know, I was high, the girl was high and I was like so in a spiritual moment. It was unbelievable. We were on the floor having sex and I ejaculated like even before I put it inside her. Like I literally ejaculated on her stomach and it was this huge load and I was like, fuck, I can't believe I did that. And that was when I was high. Now, other times when I've been high, that didn't happen, right? So it just kind of, it, 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 it varied. And obviously it's hard to do a study like that to like show exactly what would happen in a human being because there's... Too many things involved, too many things to control. So, so that's my experience with that. Now, what about testosterone? Now, here's the thing. Generally, when studies were done, sometimes they were done with drug users. Sometimes they were done with patients in a fertility clinic. Sometimes the sample size wasn't too high. Sometimes this, the group was too selected. This is a problem with science that's not funded too well. You know, weed science is not really funded well, right? Because there's no incentive really for people to know the harms of weed, like everyone's smoking weed. The worst is, is, is the, the only good thing that can happen is bad in a weed study, right? What, what, I mean, look at the trade-off. You do a weed study and you find out that it does really bad things to your body. Well, people who are going to make a lot of money by selling weed, now they can't. But if it tells you that weed is really good for you, well, people are smoking weed anyway. So that, it's not really going to be an incentive. So that's why it's really hard to do a really good study. So all the testosterone studies, some have been done with healthy individuals. Like, for example, the one that was done this year, that was done in a, ferti a fertility clinic, and they found that smoking weed increases testosterone levels. They found that smoking weed makes sperm count higher, sperm volume higher. The, the, the motility, the, the effectiveness of reproduction of sperm, better. That's what they found. There was a 2015 study in, in, in Denmark, it was a Danish study, and they did a study with guys who were recruited in the military, right? They do all these tests and it was like 1,500 people. It was a great study. And they found similar results. They found that testosterone in the guys who smoke weed is higher than in the ones who don't smoke weed. And they found about a 7% increase in, or 7% higher testosterone in those who smoke weed. And they had done a, a specific study where they, they looked at uh, if the person smoked weed less than once a week or more than once a week. And they found that guys who smoked more than once a week had a 7% higher testosterone than, than those who never smoked. And, and, and so that was, that's also an interesting study. So there's a couple of studies that, were, that are done pretty well in, in my opinion, they're, they're good studies that show an increase, a higher testosterone levels in those who smoke weed. But then there are other studies, more than just two, 
several studies, four, five, six maybe different studies with animals and humans that show a decrease in testosterone levels when you smoke weed. Now, some of those studies are done, like I said, with you know, drug users. Some of them are done with older patients. Some of them are done with patients with a certain type of uh, uh, impotence or infertility. They're done at a, a fertility clinic. So it's hard to know which studies to trust and which studies to not trust. That's the real truth about whether weed affects testosterone or not. There's a bunch of studies that show that it affects testosterone negatively. Good studies. But then there are maybe two studies, again, good studies, that show that it increases testosterone. There's higher testosterone levels in those who smoke marijuana. Then there's a few studies that show that there is no difference between those who smoke weed and, and, and testosterone. Now, in my honest opinion, if I were to do an experiment, I would do it better than all of them. Now, a lot of these people aren't, in, again, in my opinion, they're not really good scientists. Why? Well, first of all, if they were, these studies would be published in better journals, right? They're, these are not great journals that these studies are published in. Second, they would do them in a more rigorous way. Like, for example, controlling certain factors of what these people's lifestyles are. Because just because testosterone correlates with smoking weed, that doesn't mean it's a causal thing. It doesn't mean that smoking weed actually causes higher testosterone. Or having higher testosterone is causing someone to smoke weed. Like we don't know what's causing what or even if they're causing each other at all. It's just a correlation. So it's really hard for me to really trust these studies because they can't factor in the controls. I mean, sometimes they ask people to fill out a survey. And, and when someone fills out a survey, it's, it's hard to know how much weed they smoke, what strain they use. They, they, they don't group them in strains of marijuana. Um, it's just really difficult for me right now to give you an answer of this is what marijuana does to testosterone. I can't tell you. And that's why we don't know. That's why the controversy, it's real, man. Like, I would be very dishonest if I told you that, oh, you should smoke marijuana because it increases testosterone. Or you shouldn't smoke marijuana because it decreases testosterone. I just don't know. Nobody knows yet. That's the reality, man. And I'm sorry. Now, uh, I talked about the controls and, and, and so on. But I'll tell you one thing. Okay. If you are worried, because look, look at cigarette smoke, right? We needed 7,000 studies that showed that cigarettes cause lung cancer and cardiovascular disease and all these things, all these problems in the body to, for doctors to stop or, or prescribing uh, uh, nicotine to their patients. Because back in the day, in the 30s and 40s, doctors were prescribing medicinal nic you know, nicotine and cigarette smokes to their patients for illnesses. And they were smoking themselves. A lot of doctors smoked cigarettes. And it took, like I said, six, 7,000 scientific studies that showed the negative effects of nicotine on the body for them to say that, oh, we need to put these, these little notes on the packages to say that you shouldn't be smoking cigarettes. So who knows what's going to happen with weed, man. Now with legalization and recreational use, hopefully we'll have more studies and we'll know more. But this is what we know about testosterone and, and that's, that's the honest truth. All right. But again, you have, to, you have to ask yourself, what are the benefits of you smoking weed? If the benefits are out numbering or, or, or out powering, you know, they're, they're, they're out balancing, outweighing the potential of the negative effects on your testosterone levels. If only then should you smoke weed. I mean, look at me. 
you know, I have superman testosterone levels. My bioavailable testosterone is just like off the charts. I didn't do it with weed. I mean, I haven't smoked weed in two and a half, three years. So, and, and the guys who have doubled their testosterone that are part of the Afro-D Academy or even part of the testosterone transformation group, they don't smoke weed either. I mean, the guys I've been interviewing with the one-on-ones, they don't smoke weed. So I don't think that has to be in your repertoire, in your, in your, in your equation of boosting testosterone. That's my opinion, okay? All right, so we talked about testosterone. And we'll talk, about more, to talk more about this stuff as, as, I, as I go forward. Now let's talk about sperm, okay? Now this is, I'm gonna talk about it here. This is for you guys who care about having a baby one day. Because look, in, the, in America and in Europe, many parts of the West, there's this issue with infertile men. Right? Men can't have babies. You know, there's in vitro babies happening. Uh, there's infertility clinics that are just having a lot of customers. So people are wondering, why are men impotent? Why can't they have children? And marijuana is one of the hypotheses. So listen up if you want to have a baby one day. So I would say that marijuana's negative effect on sperm was very much established fact for many, many, many years. A lot of studies found this. Now recently, like the 2019 study, the study this, this year that came out, and, and, and a couple of studies before that showed that marijuana use improves sperm parameters, improves reproductive function. So again, that's a controversial thing. But again, in my opinion, from all the papers I've read, most of them, like more than 90% of them, show negative effects of smoking marijuana on sperm. Okay? Now, the, the parameters are sperm volume, concentration, motility, which is, you know, the... the fact how, how well it moves morphology what it looks like and the acrosomal reaction this is the reaction that happens when the sperm targets the egg the ovum and uh or the ova and 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 the th that reaction allows conception to happen right it's the start of it so the acrosomal reaction is also affected negatively with thc with cb1 receptors and specifically with marijuana use. Now how? The mitochondrial respiration is affected negatively. So if you think of a sperm cell, right? And, and remember, a sperm cell, spermatozoa, that's what the scientific name is of a sperm cell, it has CB1 receptors on it. Okay? THC can target the sperm cell itself. It's unbelievable. This endocannabinoid system is all over the body. And the way it does it is that it affects ATP. The ability of the mitochondria to have respiration, to produce energy, that is what is affected. That is the mechanism by which THC or marijuana affects sperm. Okay? So it's the mitochondrial respiration. Um, we've also found testicular degeneration in rats which are exposed to THC. We've also found tumors in these cells inside the rat, okay? And the weight also decreases uh, of these cells. So, so what do I mean by that? Imagine a rat. If you weigh the rat's testes, right? The weight reflects how many cells the rat has. If the cells are degenerate or are they viable and active and powerful. So when these testes weigh less, we have an indication that something is wrong with the cells inside. They're, the cells are getting destroyed, they're getting degenerated. So the weight also decreases. And this is something we know in an apoptosis, which is something I've covered in previous videos. It's when a cell undergoes programmed death. And, and the program is written inside the cell. It's in the DNA of the cell. And that is what happens with THC increase. And, and here I've drawn what normal sperm look like. And this is what abnormal sperm look like. Sometimes they'll have two heads. Sometimes they'll have this weird shape in the middle. Sometimes the, the head will be too big. 
And this is what normal sperm look like. So in order for your sperm to work, they need to be normal. They need to be able to move fast. Their form has to look good, their morphology, what it's called. And you have to have enough of them. You have to have a, enough of a percentage of them that work. I remember when I did my sperm test, you know, I also wanted to be sure of what's going on. The doctor called me after, I kind of got scared. I'm like, shit, am I all right? And he said that I should donate because my percentage of viable sperm was so high. And it's like, thank God. And even at this age, like it's, it's, it's really good. So I, I'm very happy about that. So, and, and you can also go, go do that. Like I, I kind of schemed my way into it because even the blood tests, sometimes you go do them and they fuck with you and they bitch at you and they don't, they don't let you take all the blood tests you want. So sometimes you have to make up a story and then you, you get all the tests because that's just bureaucracy. So I had to do that and then I, I got my sperm results and stuff and, and, and it was really good. So you can go to a sperm clinic and do that yourself and get all your results. So that's what we know about sperm, okay? Mostly cannabis, in my opinion, from all the studies I've read, will, will affect sperm in a negative way, okay? Again, it's controversial. Studies say different things. Like, what can I do? I'm just telling you the truth. I'm just the messenger here. I wish I could do these studies and, 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 and learn better. Last topic is how does weed affect the brain? Now we getting a little bit robust. We, we know a little bit more about it. Appetite first, okay? Let's discuss appetite. We know quite a bit about this. Um, uh, it's called hyperphagia. It's when you have a higher appetite for something, you know, especially food. And they found that when they give THC in rats, the rats become more hungry. They want to eat more. And, and I'm sure you've noticed this too in yourself. I mean, I know I have. When I smoke weed, I want to eat everything. And I, I'm really, really hungry. So that, that's something we know for sure. Okay, so appetite will increase. Then we look at anxiety, okay? So, if especially, I wouldn't say THC is so much of an anxiety, anti-anxiety drug, but if you look at uh, cannabinol, right, the other uh, component, or cannabidiol, you know, CBD oil, this is something you might be taking. These types of ingredients inside cannabis, inside marijuana, are known as anti-anxiety ingredients, anxiolytic uh, ingredients. And what they do is they reduce anxiety by targeting serotonin receptors. You might have heard about this neurotransmitter, serotonin. So serotonin receptors known as 5-HT receptors, 5-HT1, 5-HT2, and so on. Serotonin is one of the neurotransmitters that affects mood. How good do you feel? You know, when you eat a banana at night, there's tryptophan, uh, that is a, one of the precursors of serotonin. And that is why one of the things is, oh, if, you, if you, it's hard for you to go to sleep, eat some bananas. It's going to make you sleep easier because you're going to get in a better mood because that tryptophan is a precursor to 5-HT serotonin and that's going to increase serotonin, better mood, and you go to sleep better. And it might work. It works for a lot of people. Um, so that's what they found, that the effects of cannabinol is through 5-HT serotonin, and that is how you get less anxiety when you smoke weed. So that is something we know for sure. Uh, public speaking, you know, they've done studies where, I just marked with this red pen on my pants. They've done studies where public speaking becomes easier for human individuals after they take cannabis. So this is also something we know, public speaking. Epilepsy is being treated with cannabis. Uh, Parkinson's disease is being treated with cannabis. Alzheimer's disease is being treated with cannabis. There's even a discussion and, and, and a lot of ther therapy done where especially little kids who have cancer, the pain associated with that cancer goes away when they go on marijuana, when they have medicinal marijuana. So that's also something we know very well. So that is what is happening when it comes to the brain and THC and, THC and, and, and marijuana, right? So now we, we understand this. 
So, look, <laughs> I'll tell you again, there's a lot of research to be done. There's a lot of studies we still need to do, and there's not much we, we know about this topic yet. But what I would tell you, in, in summary, right, let's, let's conclude here with a, with a statement of, of really what I believe and what my opinion is. If you're smoking weed to escape reality, right, to escape the physical environment, right, you're, you're, you're suffering, your pain, going inside yourself and searching for, for love inside, for meaning inside instead of outside, if you're trying to escape that reality by smoking, or you're trying to improve your sleep, you know, sleep is one of those things that, again, it's, it depends on how much you take. So a little bit of marijuana can help you sleep, but if you take a lot, it may hurt your sleep, right? So there's this balance between how much marijuana you can take. If you are using marijuana as a crutch, oh, I need to sleep, so I gotta smoke. Oh man, I, uh, I need to gain weight. I need to have more appetite, so I gotta smoke. No, oh, I, I, I'm so depressed, I gotta smoke. I, I, I can't get aroused with this hot girl, I gotta smoke. If you're using marijuana to escape reality, escape your manhood, your masculinity, don't do it. That, I believe, is a big mistake. But if you're using marijuana for medicinal purposes, for a real purpose, not because your douchey doctor uh, prescribed it to you because he's going to make more money because it's like some insurance plan or something, not because of that, because you really need it for your issues. Don't do it just because your friends are doing it. Don't do it just because your group is doing it. I mean, that's why we have the Dirty 30 Challenge for the Aphrodite Academy. Because I want these guys to know that they can go 30 days without weed. They can go 30 days without porn. They can go 30 days without drugs and alcohol. And 30 days taking Aphrodite every day. I mean, they do that anyway, but now they're showing it to, to, the, to, to everyone and, and, and really proud of what they're doing. So that's what I want to say in, in summary and conclusion. Finally, we're going to be posting these types of videos every Tuesday. Okay, so today is Tuesday, you got this video. The next video will come out next Tuesday. What do you want me to make a video about? What do you want to know about? I'll do my best, man. Like sometimes there are no answers, but you can still have a very intellectual discussion with yourself. See, now with this knowledge, you go read a paper or you go and become a scientist. You know, if it's someone who, you're in your undergrad, you don't know what to do with for your master's project, or you're doing an honors thesis, go do it on weed, man. Learn, like go figure shit out so we can learn from you. Go do this project yourself. No one's stopping you from doing it. I'm not gonna do it, you go do it. Um, so, and then, and so, so whatever topic you want me to discuss, post in the comments below, put your question in there. Uh, fill out the Google form that we've sent you so I can have your question in detail. Send me an email with your question, whatever you like. And we're going to be dropping the one-on-ones every Thursday. Okay? So you're going to see the one-on-one -on -one this Thursday, which is how I, you know, when I interview the Aphrodite Academy members, I celebrate their victories. You know, if dub they've doubled their testosterone, they've in increased their libido, their sexual performance. I interview them and celebrate their victories to you guys. So you'll see that on Thursdays. Um, and f every Friday, you're going to see a video dropped on YouTube. So I've also started making general videos for YouTube and for general Facebook. So you'll see that coming out Friday. So three videos every week for you guys. Let me know what you want. If you want Afro D, okay? If you're interested in grabbing Afro D, look at the comments below. The link is there and go grab it. With Afro D, D you get the Academy for free. You get 24 seven support for free. Monthly workshops you get access to all the workshop we've already done, the four workshop, it's like 25 hours of content, you get that. Uh, again, it's all bonuses, it's all free. You get every course that I've ever written over the last five years, you get all of that for free. You get to come with me one-on-one -on -one and do a two hour, you know, one and a half to two hour session with me for the Academy members, for this group, you get that included for free. 
right? So with this subscription of AfroD, you get all of this. You get the members only Facebook group. You get the members only website. I can't wait for all of you to be a part of it. And we grow to you know, 5,000 people. Right now we're, we're about 140 people. And you know, by the end of this month, we'll be at 420 people. That's our goal. And so I urge you, sign on, get on, enroll, and let's do this. And finally, um, yeah, thank you for watching. Um, it's a great topic for me. If you want to see any differences in how I present you these topics, if you want to see something done better, any feedback you have for me, I welcome it wholeheartedly so I can become better for you. Uh, thanks so much. This is Doc Farhan, and I'll see you soon. Love you, man.